this is, this is, this is. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, the reason I really wanted to talk to you is because I wanted to ask if it's true that you actually like Nickelback. <laughs> I did. I did a TikTok about about Nickelback and how they're like the most uh, notoriously hated band, but they do have some riffs. And like, I've never been like a like a guilty pleasure kind of guy. Like, if I think something's good, I'm I'm just gonna roll with it. You know, like yeah. when I was a kid and new metal was so popular. Like everyone I know loved Limp Biscuit, and then it was like I don't know, two three years later, it was like everybody I knew tried to pretend they didn't have a Limp Biscuit phase, and I <laughs> yeah. I will never pretend that I didn't have a Limp Biscuit phase, you know. And now it's kind of funny that like they almost have like cred again, like it's like they hit like a re like a reverse Uno card, and all of a sudden Limp Biscuit is cool again, but yeah. like I've never like turned back on any of the stuff that I like. Like I understand why I liked it. And so when I was a kid, Silver Side Up came out, Nickelback, dude. I thought that stuff was great. I loved Stained. I loved Nickelback, Creed, all of that stuff. I ate it up, man. It was on K-Rock constantly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got to admit, some of those songs are really good. Even that Nickelback song, even if you don't like that style of music, it's a good song. And yeah. You, you know, if you listen to it enough, you're going to be singing it back, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Yeah, I, I kind of joke and I said it's like it's the lowest common denominator of radio rock. Uh, and like they have, you know, a formula and they stick to it. But but like I also love early Weezer and they had a formula and they stuck to it. You know, yeah. it's like so I, I don't mind stuff if it's formulated, formulaic and pop structure. Uh, I, I love that stuff, man. Yeah. So, you know, let's get into just a little bit for, for everybody listening. Um, we actually I don't think I've. I don't know if we've ever met I don't met think we've before. ever met, You've no. never been on the show before, so welcome to the show. Um, this Wildlife, I've seen you guys play. I've, you know, I've seen you guys come up through the scene. Uh, but, yeah, we just haven't really crossed personal paths. So uh, this will be a good, a good, you know, icebreaker, a good, good just chat. You know, I'm looking forward For sure. to it. Uh, this Wildlife, how did you guys get get that going? You came up in the scene. Where are you, where are you, where are you at right now? Are you living – where you're from where you are you in california i long live beach? in phoenix now uh, okay. the band is from long beach that's where i grew up uh, but we're just a two-piece so we're kind of like an acoustic emo band basically uh the other member we both play guitar and i sing and the other member he's from pittsburgh uh born and raised and then he moved out to long beach when he was like 20 uh, and he moved out there because he wanted to play drums in a band so he flew out you know from pittsburgh with his fucking dw drum set and a couple of bucks and slept on couches for a while and then I ended up meeting him uh, working at Guitar Center together and he was my manager at the time and uh, and then he and then he joined <laughs> my band so then I had the he had the upper hand and then I topsy turvied him and then I had the upper hand because now he's in my band and you know we started off as like a like a full uh, five piece pop punk band I was just playing guitar that whittled down the singer quit. They forced me into singing for the band. Now all of a sudden we're a four piece pop punk band and I'm singing and playing guitar, which is like, was my nightmare because I don't have like a ton of self-confidence. And I always just, I just wanted to like rock out and have like a hype lead singer that would dive into the crowd and shove the mic in the crowd's face. But instead I became the guy singing. Uh, and that we did that for a few years locally and we were kind of like low hanging fruit for a few managers that picked us up think, thinking they can get us signed. They could not get us signed. We ended up getting dropped by several people and just a lot of just like nice no's from people in the industry. And at a certain point, Anthony and I, the two remaining members from uh, when the band started, we just decided let's just go acoustic and we can do this stuff really cheaply. We'll continue working at Guitar Center, make a bunch of YouTube videos and Maybe, you know, we'll buy a Prius and we can drive up and down the West Coast playing shows. And that was kind of the goal for a while. But uh, it, it kind of escalated from that uh, back in like 2013 when we signed to Epitaph Records. But um, yeah, that's that's how we met and got started. So that's that's why we're kind of like this. Um, I wouldn't say odd man out, but we're kind of like an island within like the pop punk scene of th the only acoustic band living in this space. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you know, I appreciate the background because it it does bring questions like, how are these guys so into into like 
rock, you know, like looking at some of your TikTok stuff you're on Instagram. Uh, you, you do great videos, by the way. You guys are hilarious. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I was I was like wondering, like, how did how did they get to the acoustic thing? I'm just so confused because it, it, you guys look like you're in hardcore bands, which you said you were. So it makes sense. So uh, that's that's beautiful, though, because obviously acoustic guitars, it's like what we as songwriters, <laughs> you know, we use all the that's time. what you grab. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's like a lot of bands kind of try to get away with doing tours acoustically and be like, oh, right. let's go ahead and do it. You know, we can, one, save money. You know, it's just a lot less gear to deal with. You yeah. know, it's just like easier. So like the fact that you're living that now as like your normal. And so when you go, when you go the opposite direction, you add, you, maybe sometimes you guys do adding full band to things, you know. Yeah. That's where it it's kind of becomes fun because it's not like what you're doing all the time, right? Like you guys have, I've seen some of your videos. So Anthony plays the drums, obviously. Yep. Then he'll come up and play guitar with, you know, on the side of you. So, I mean, there's a lot of options you guys have. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, and, and we actually have like our merch dude. Um, he plays guitar and, and we'll force him to play banjo, mandolin, <laughs> you know, like, like he's yeah. like our utility guy. It's our dude Jabroni. He's toured with us since like, you know, 2013. And is his he's name just Jabroni like, or is that his nickname? Uh, that's his nickname, but self-proclaimed. Like we don't, <laughs> we're not clowning on him. Like that's what he referred to himself <laughs> as. Uh, sometimes I forget that when I say, I say it out loud and it's so normal. Jabroni. But when, when I hear his actual name, Adam, it's like, it like, it's like, what, who? I don't, I don't even know who you're talking about. Yeah. But so, so yeah, Ant will jump on drums and, and he does a lot of, um, switching around on instruments and stuff. And like on our last record cycle, we had like a whole busking set up where, you know, I had the kick drum up front. Uh, that's where we kind of picked up the, uh, the moniker, the, the hot topic Mumford and sons is what we were referred to as a while. <laughs> uh, cause you know, Anth had the hi hat with the tambourine on it and stuff. So we kind of do everything that we can live. Uh, and then we, t we run a ton of tracks, whether it's piano strings, bass, uh, all of that stuff. And like when we first started, I was so against running backtracks because that's just not the scene I grew up in. You know, like mm -hmm. that was a pop thing. I was always playing in hardcore bands and punk bands. Uh, you know, the closest I ever got was having the SPDS sample pad for 808s and stuff, you know? Yeah. And like, so, so going to do backtracking, I was like, man, I really don't want to do that because it's fake, you know? Mm -hmm. And we got an offer to do our first warp tour in 2014. And me knowing what Warp Tour was like, because I'd gone my whole, you know, life growing up as a teenager, I was like, I know for a fact we're going to be playing a hundred feet away from Attila or some shit, and no one's going to be able to hear our, like us playing because we're just going to get blown out by drums and bass over there. And so our first Warp Tour, I was like, okay, I'm going to program bass so at least we can have a full fat sound instead of just two kind of thin acoustic guitars on stage. And then from there, it was like well, we had strings on our record and that sounded cool. Why don't we throw those in the backtracks too? You know, and then you kind of like, you loosen up with it and over a while you just go, you look out at the crowd and you go, oh, these people don't care. These people don't care at all, you know? And then I, I like one year I went to a 21 Pilots concert and I was like, okay, there's a drummer and there's a singer and there's a million things going on. And there's also 20,000 people here enjoying themselves. And so I kind of loosened up over the years and just decided like, let's do as much as possible humanly possible with the two of us or the three of us with jabroni you know jumping yeah. <laughs> in and then throw the rest of it in the tracks and let's just play the fucking music and have a good time yeah and so so the live show is definitely since then the live show has definitely evolved from just the two of us with acoustics that's new to me for sure and, and i've been dreading that like you you kind of like took the plunge and just went for it but i've just never done it i am an i am a, i've lived most of my life right like and 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 I've never done um, really a kind of akin to the studio, like a click, something with a, a click or a, a grid, right? And then your tracks play where they play. Yeah. So as a layman, I don't understand this at all. So how do you, do you have like, do you have like a computer that you push the button and then the click starts going one, two, three, four, you know, click, click. And you're like, okay, we got to start the song. If we don't start the song, the strings are off. Like, how does that work yeah. a little bit? Yeah, you, you kind of nailed it on the head. So we run like a laptop and um, we are both drummers before we ever started this band. We're both lifelong drummers, right? So this is my first band I've ever played guitar or sang in. And well done, so I'm used, to play, I'm used to playing I'm used to playing it with a click, right? Okay. And so is, so is Anthony. 
And so we were both always just like inner monitors from the first show. Like we have to have it because we have to play to a click. Uh, because when we first started playing acoustic, we would film ourselves playing uh, with like our phones and we'd watch it back and we'd be like, dear God, we played that song like 20 beats per minute faster than it should have been. You know, it was just right. like stage fright or whatever it was, adrenaline. Um, and, and it was just like, OK, we need to get back on click because as drummers, we could just play to the click and rock the the tempo and stay in the pocket. But as guitarists, we are not we are not doing that. We're getting way ahead of ourselves and energizing the songs too much. And they sound hilarious when you listen back, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so right away we jumped on the click. And like I said, on our first shows, no backtrack at all, just playing along to click. And then once we started doing the bass, well, that's where you have to have cues, right? You can't just jump in and start playing. You got to one, two, three, four. The song starts and you cannot come off or else it'll be. You know, you'll have like an Ashley Simpson moment or something. You know, you'll end up embarrassing yourself. Yeah. Um, the benefit of doing it that way is that um, we're like an incredibly DIY band. Uh, I I bought us like a lighting rig years and years ago for our first headline tour. Uh, and we still use those lights, some of those lights today, but we've upgraded along the way. But I program light shows that go along with it. So when he hits play, he's triggering our backtracks and he's triggering our whole stage production. So we're able to go out and do tours without having to pay, you know, an LD to come out with us, paying them a thousand a week or plus. Right. Yeah. So we're able to save a lot of money and still, uh, you know, we're a small club band. So we're going into small clubs, but we're still bringing in production into these small rooms because I'm just I geek out on that stuff. I love uh, live lighting. I love the the live show. And I, I go to a lot of like arena concerts and stuff like that. And I just like always geek out on it and I love the experience. I'm like, how can we bring this kind of vibe into chain reaction size venues? You know, mm -hmm. that's cool, man. I, I like that. Uh, you know, just hearing you talk about acoustic, watching yourselves back, you know, like you're watching game tape in a way. And, yeah. and that's some of the hardest thing to do, you know, for, especially for artists to like listen to themselves. It's like, Oh, it's so painful sometimes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> can be oh, every time. But that reminds me that, uh, Looking back, you know, not having played with a click, whenever I'm playing acoustic guitar with somebody playing acoustic guitar, unless you're like super locked in and you've like rehearsed a lot, it's really hard to to just do things together in a way that sounds percussively the right way and yeah. and you can get off on your strums really easily. So like I can see how that click really can click it all into place. Yeah. yeah. I played like marching band all four years in high school. Uh, I played snare with my, my drum line. We do drum competitions mm -hmm. and stuff. And that was, that was incredible because like there is no click track with that. Right. So you have one guy that counts you in and everybody has to just listen and play really tight together. And so when you have a line of like four or five or six snare players, the, the snares that they play, like there's no reverb. It's just a tap, right. It's just, there's mm -hmm. no sustain. Right. So if anybody is off a little bit, it's incredibly obvious. It sounds like a total flam. It doesn't sound like all the snares striking at the same time. And so I think that helped me in a way, and, and Anth being a drummer as well, that helped us to be at least be able to play together well without coming off from each other. But it was just, I think it was just the nerves early on. And we just like, it was very quick that we were just like, okay, we need a click track right away because this is like, you know, we're playing like a pretty kind of slow ballad and then live we're seeing it and it's like, OK, this is like all of a sudden this is mid tempo in, and sounding kind of funny and I'm singing too quickly and you can't hear what I'm saying. So we kind of nipped that in the bud really early on and got ourselves on a track to try to put on as professional of a show as we can with just three dudes on tour. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, the more production you add to something, the more I feel like adding tracks. If you're if you're at like open mic and you're playing to tracks, I don't know. But, but I mean, maybe you do that because you have to like practice for your show. But uh, I, I, I love the idea of having lighting done on your own. That is so cool. Yeah. I, I've never, uh, man, I'm just so bad at like just thinking of those things. But um, can I ask you? I, obs I obsess over it, man. Yeah. It's like that's my favorite part about going on tour is coming up with a theme. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like I do like um, – I'm not super, super handy, but I'll build set pieces for every tour that we do. Um, like, I mean, <laughs> they started really simple. Like our first uh, headline tour I did, it was a, it was like a under the, under the sea theme. So I bought like a bubble machine for the stage and then I got um, these big uh, umbrellas and mm -hmm. then hung streamers from them and uplit them. So they looked like floating 
uh, jellyfish on the stage. And that, that was like really hokey and cheap. You know, it cost me like 40 bucks to buy these umbrellas on Amazon. Uh, but from there it really grew into different things. And so we've had like one of our, I think our very last headline tour, uh, was called the little light tour. And I, I built a lighthouse that had like a, you know, a freaking light in it that turns around and then like a big sailboat, you know, that had like the cannons po poking out of the sides of the wall of the boat were lights and stuff. And so, so I figure out ways to do these things and, and, you know, God willing fit them into the fucking trailer yeah. Uh, you know, with all of this, you know, we had like a, uh, I think it ended up being like eight feet tall, the lighthouse, you know, so I had to make it so you could break it down and pack it into the trailer. But I love that stuff, man. It's like, I think being able to be creative in different ways, uh, and not having the redundancy on tour, uh, of every time you go out on tour, it's the same shit over and over. That's what really keeps me inspired and keeps me having fun with this. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So you change it up every time. And do you feel like now you have to change it up every time? Like, what if you guys went out with like no production? With nothing? That would have to be the theme of that tour, right? Like, <laughs> we're tired the, tour. <laughs> no, the bar, the bar stools tour or something where we just sit on bar stools. Uh, yeah, this is something actually Ant said this to me early on. He said, if you do this, you can never stop. And it always has to be better. Every time yeah. you do it, it has to be better, you know? And so, and he was right, you know, yeah. it, it's something, but like I said, like I, I get a kick out of it and the, the programming part of it, uh, like actually sitting down and doing all of the lighting cues, it takes an ungodly amount of time to get all the time code right and get everything firing on beat. And because I'm a drummer, I won't just go, okay, green lights look cool. I'm like, no, it needs to be pulsing with the beat and do all this and that. So I get really intricate with it and it becomes insanely time consuming. You know, I'll spend anywhere from like 60 to a hundred hours programming a light show before a tour. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm just like, I'll set up the lights. I used to set them in front of me. Now my my desk for the, the Twitch setup is faced this way. So I have the lights behind me now. But normally I would just sit in my garage. And I live in Phoenix now. So, you know, sometimes it's just ungodly hot. Yeah. And I just have blinding <laughs> lights blasting me in the face for, you know, eight hours a day sometimes. Wow, that is interesting. So, okay. So you're t you take... Where are you where are you are you using your laptop or your computer your desktop computer or something my laptop yeah so I'm just trying to think um, how do you play the tracks do you play those through Pro Tools through some other program through Ableton Live Ableton Live okay that's that's yep. a fairly normal that's something I've never really used I've opened it up and gone I don't know what I'm doing so I same <laughs> you just have to spend Been time using with it for it. years and I still feel that way <laughs> <laughs> right but that has a lot of a lot of great things about it it's very robust yep. and it, it's it doesn't crash as much as like say pro tools would right like that's yeah partly why um so do you have that going on so you you already have your show kind of programmed audio wise like this is our yeah. set and what happens if you want to change this song and put this other song can you kind of modually do that in ableton live or in and then yeah also you just, with lighting i set it up as tracks right so if we okay. want to do transitions between songs then I will have to play those songs together, right? So okay. if one song goes into the next one, there's no changing that around, right? But it's not like one long session file. It's okay. it's like individual tracks. So it's like if we wanted to move the set list around, like if we started a tour and we go, hey, this song needs to go or this song needs to be spaced out differently, uh, we can do that really easily. But if there are transitions and stuff, I've seen bands that run it like, it, say, say if you're on a support uh, tour, right? And you have 30 minutes, 30 hard minutes. You can't go over a second over. They will program out that 30 minutes, including banter and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And give themselves just this, and they'll have, you know, cues in their ears of, okay, 10 second break, uh, you know, and then this back like, next, <laughs> and they'll, they'll say what song it is and stuff like that. Like some people's cues are crazy. We are in a way where like we keep it loose because we do a lot of headlining mm -hmm. and we keep it really loose because I just start talking and I can't fucking stop talking, you know? Mm -hmm. And as you, I'm sure I'm demonstrating here to you. <laughs> I but, love it. Uh, this is good. <laughs> but so Anth is the cue guy, right? So he'll sit there by the laptop <laughs> and just kind of look at me and then he'll be like, okay, it looks like he's stopping talking and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to stop talking and then have him like push the button and then have a long count. Like depending on the song, yeah. there's probably different counts. <laughs> One, two, two. Two, two, three, <laughs> two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's got he's gotten good at that. Like he's good with the timing of it, so that it's not awkward. And like that's something like I really 
um, stress on with, with our touring is do not make it awkward for the audience. You know, like I'll, sometimes I'll see a band and they'll finish a song and then the, yeah, it'll kind of just ring out a little bit. And the crowd is like kind of quiet, like, Oh, is the song over or not? Uh, uh, okay. Now we'll start clapping and, and it's kind of awkward. And I'm, I'm like, I say, thank you. <laughs> like yeah. At the, at the very end, like, <laughs> make it blatantly obvious to the crowd because they're waiting to do this thing, right? They want to do this because they know that's what they're supposed to do. And if you don't give them the cue to do that, then there's that awkward moment. That's so true. That's so true. It's funny. It's kind of like comedians have to like wait for the laugh or, right. you know, or, you know, not, not step over your own, you know, audience laughing. Same musicians do that all the time. You know, they step over their own crowd, probably like enjoying the moment, like let them enjoy the moment, breathe a little yeah. bit and then go into the next song. And, and punk bands like my band is, you know, we do have a lot of songs where it's just like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. But there are, it, it is good to like kind of pay attention to, all right, is there a moment here? Does, does, does there need to be a palate cleanser? So having it each track modulate, I think, makes a lot of sense you can stop do the lights come down a little bit or, or have yeah. a default setting maybe like a yeah yeah that's cool so okay so you program everything whether it's ableton live or the the lighting program just all on your laptop and that same laptop that goes on tour with you or can you uh, transfer no usually i'll transfer files tra over okay, and stuff okay. like it's this is kind of getting into the weeds of it and it's pretty geeky but like i will program everything in logic pro and the way that I program the lighting cues is using MIDI, right? So wow. I create all of okay. these different looks and then using MIDI controls which look it goes to. Uh, and Logic and, is an audio recorder. It's like yeah. Apple's version of Pro Tools. I have it, but exactly. just for people. Uh, it's I like, love it's the like weeds, GarageBand. by the way. I love all the weeds. I love the weeds. <laughs> yeah, but so, so essentially what I'm doing is programming all of these looks where – the light is pointed this way and it's this color and this intensity and it takes this long for it to go from this look to the next look where the light is pointed that way. Then this light turns green instead of blue and you, you create all of those different looks, right? And then you create cues for the looks. So you have lighting looks is, which is usually just like something static or mm -hmm. it could be, it could have motion to it. And then the cue is what tells the, the lights to do the next look instead of what the current look is. And so the cues are set up when I'm in logic uh, it's like I'm drawing MIDI notes of at this beat, it goes from here and then the kick hits. And so this light flashes and then the snare hits. So this white light flashes and you go in and create all of those cues. And then there's an interface that basically uh, converts the MIDI signal, which is the computer's way of telling what note is playing mm -hmm. to DMX signal, which is the, the language that lighting uses. And it's just this, you know, it's 275 bucks. It's this little box that you plug into your laptop. And it allows you to to do the dummy like MIDI notes on here to convert that to lighting language, mm -hmm. and it's it's worked, man. It has never broken on me. I've <laughs> we've had this thing for like eight years now, and it keeps working. So amazing. I'm not changing. This is not also this is the really like white trash way of doing this. Like there are much better ways of doing what I'm doing, but like 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 you using uh, Skype, like right, it's working, <laughs> baby. I'm rolling. I'm rolling. I'm not stopping. <laughs> That's true. I mean, that's the thing is like, there's probably lighting guys that are like, what? what are you doing? You know, but, uh, oh, yeah. but just the fact that it works. And I would say that it's like that with a lot of things that I first learned where I'm like so confused, but then you just, you spend time with it. It could be like something like an editing software, like Pro Tools or not, sure. not or Pro Tools Audio or Final Cut Pro if you're, you know, if you're doing like on Apple. Um, it's it was very confusing to learn Final Cut Pro for one for me and I had come from the old school Final Cut Pro like back in like Final Cut Pro three or something you know yeah but uh, th those I find that like once you take time and you learn it then it just works and and yeah with this lighting situation if you can just keep working it's so technical you're like snare light kick light whatever yeah. it is it's like to me that sounds like you're you're I would sit down and just stare at the matrix, you know, like all these green numbers <laughs> just floating down. But as you stare at it longer, you start seeing, oh, there's a girl in a you red dress. You understand the code. Yeah, you see that girl <laughs> in the red dress and everything starts making sense. And and, and so, so people out there that are listening going, this is ridiculous. I could never do that. Or, or I mean, I kind of like feel the same way, you know, hearing you say that you do your own lighting. But I know that, no, I could probably figure that out. Like I could, 
Yeah. Oh, anybody yeah. can, man. Yeah. It's just it's intimidating. It. It's intimidating at first and stuff, but it's just like, you know, it's just YouTube Academy, dude. You just <laughs> you just get the get the tools that you need. You know, like when, when I first started, I literally was in my apartment uh, and I bought a single light and I go, I want to get this light to go along with the beat of one of our songs. And I, and I only bought one because I was like, if I can't figure it out, I don't want to waste money buying a bunch of lights, right? So it was before our very first headline tour, I bought one single light. It was 150 bucks, and then I spent $275 on this little interface, and I got the light to fucking work. It took me like an entire day to turn this light blue, but as soon as I got that light blue, I was like, okay, I think I can, I think I could do this. And I'm yes. sending, you know, <laughs> iPhone videos to Anth, like, dude, I'm getting this fucking light to go along to the song right now, you know? And it's just like, yes, bing, bing. That's amazing. <laughs> and that was it, but it grew into so much more. That's a good feeling. I, I remember when I learned to record, like back 1999, I started getting into recording and audio recording. And there were days where I, I would take, it, you know, we had this like Mackie digital eight bus console. It was cutting edge, you know, like digital. Yeah. Like, but there was something wrong with it at some point. And this was like pre, maybe the internet existed. Yeah, I guess it did. But I don't, I don't think I had it. <laughs> it's weird to say that. But I was on the phone for like two days, like trying to get somebody to help me with this thing. And finally, it finally got it to work. You did it yourself. I had to call somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had YouTube on my side. You didn't at the time. Yeah, that, that absolutely helps these days. Like I use YouTube for just about everything that I don't know about anything I yeah. need to learn about YouTube is my first, my first go for sure. Cle from cleaning crabs, which I did this morning to uh, no anything technical. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I dude, I love learning shit like that. And like, I've always been kind of the type of person to be a sponge. Cause like playing in the music industry, you know, f you have times where you're in the studio, right? And there's a lot of guys, I'll, you know, if I'm in the studio with another band, I'll see a guy who's just kind of like, laying on the couch, playing Candy Crush on his phone or fucking around and stuff. And there's so much talent in this room and so much awesome shit going on that if like, if you're not taking the opportunity to absorb that and learn and ask questions, if, if you're in a place to ask questions, which if it's my band in the studio, of course I can ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people that are just happy to be the cog, right? Just the, just the, the cog in the wheel. And I have always always been the person where i go i want to get into that baby like that seems interesting to me and i want to i want to understand how it's working so that in the future if i don't have the money to go and spend you know a hundred thousand dollars making a record i'm gonna go make it in my bedroom and i'm gonna be confident in doing so because i've watched people who do this for a living and do it at a level that you know that i will realistically never reach but i'm understanding their process and how it how it's working so that I can go and, and replicate that to the best of my ability later. And that goes for anything from shooting music videos, um, shooting promos with, with cameras, audio recording, uh, stage lighting, anything in the music world. I'm always just trying to learn, man, because it's I'm constantly surrounded by super talented people. I think that's why you're so successful at what you're doing is because is you do have that attitude. And and I just remember coming up. Same thing coming up. We were recording uh, "Ever Passing Moment" with MXPX um, in, at Conway Studios in Hollywood with Jerry Finn, and I had just wow. kind of gotten the bug. Like, I, I think I'm gonna pay attention. And I started asking him, like, "How is, you know, how does the mic chain rooting work? What are all these yeah. things? You know?" Like he would he would tell me. And then like our next record before everything and after with Dave Jordan, uh, same thing. But that was our first record. We used Pro Tools, so that that was like a whole new thing. Like what? Pro now we're using a computer. We recorded to analog, and then we did all our uh, we did the drums and stuff to analog, and then we did everything else to Pro Tools. And so yeah. like that was like my uh, introduction to like the digital world. And just asking tons and tons and tons of questions. That's that's literally how I would learn to do to do really everything that I've learned to do in life. Yeah, I've 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 kind of moved through some of the different like recording mediums, uh, and this is kind of a, a like a I'll make this short and sweet. But like I had a little tape recorder, right? Like the one where you put a cassette tape in and you can hit record and record onto that tape off of this little thing that had a tiny little microphone on it, right? Yeah. And what I would do is I would record on that tape, I would put it uh, underneath a sweatshirt and play my drums, because when the, when the sweatshirt wasn't over it, it would just over, overload the mic and it sounded <laughs> yeah. like shit. So I'd put a sweatshirt over it, record some drums, and then what I'd do is I'd take that tape out and I would put it into my mom's stereo and I'd put a new tape into that recorder 
and I would play the drums on my mom's stereo from that first tape. And on the second tape, I would sit there with my guitar next to it and I would record the guitar, but it would pick up the drums from the stereo and my guitar in the room. And then I take that tape out. I switch those two tapes. I put that one into the stereo, then the other one back into the recorder. And then I would sing over it. So it was like multi-track recording over this little tape, you know, doing like cover songs of dashboard confessional or say sin when I was a kid. Uh, and that was my first medium of, of recording. And I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I didn't understand the, the concept of multi-track recording, but that's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. And then I moved from there to having a little four track cassette recorder to having an eight track digital recorder, which was mind blowing, you know, like, yeah. cause I could record. And then if I fucked up, I could go back and redo something instead. Like, cause if I fucked up on the last one, you had to start over from scratch, you know, on the tape. Mm-hmm. And so, so I've like, all along the way, I've been picking up the different techniques of stuff on our, uh, we self-produced our, our latest record ever blossom. And I don't have like a, a great recording setup. In fact, this room that I'm in now isn't what I recorded, uh, the record. And I did it in a 10 by 10 spare bedroom, uh, with eight foot ceilings, which is just dog shit for recording, right? Like couldn't be worse essentially. And I recorded drums for that album by recording one drum at a time and air drumming the other hand of what I should have been playing. Uh, so, <laughs> really? so then I could, so Amazing. then I could have every, the snare, the hi hat, the yeah. floor tom, the crash, the kick drum. And I just did the whole thing like that. And I would set up, um, little towels to hit, you know, with my hand to stay on time. Uh, and so I'm always kind of like, what, hmm. what is, what's the best version of, of the way I could do it with what I have at my disposal. Yeah. And that's the best version I could do right now. I can think of so many different ways to do that, but like, I can't argue that that probably sounded cool. Like, cause you could kind of cheat and just use samples, you know, take a sample yeah. and then, and then just play and then like put them in the right spots. But like, I think what you did probably sounds way better. It, it sounds, sounds more, more, it sounds real. more organic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, more and, real. And I, it's like, if we're a metalcore band, I would just program the drums cause they're going to sound better that way. Mm-hmm. But you know, we're doing it on a song that's kind of like a little more like folky influenced and samples aren't going to sound right on that. You know, like there's way too much dynamics and ghost notes on the snare and the way that I, that I attack the hi hats and open them a little bit, but not too much. You can't replicate that with, uh, with, with samples. You, you actually, I'm sure you could, it might take even more time. (laughs) It might take even more time though, to get in there (laughs) and TLC it and finesse the symbols and make it sound that way. And I'm like, I got a drum set here. I'm just going to carry it upstairs and fucking <laughs> record it one at a time. I mean, let's let's talk about the new record, but I, honestly, like I feel like my philosophy is is if if I don't have a good vocal, I just redo the vocal cuz I own a studio. I'm in the studio. Yeah. So it's like I get it if you if you only have so much time in the studio, if you're somebody that's going and and working at somebody else's place, then yeah, there are tricks you can you can add in post to like fix vocals or whatever, but like I'm with you. You know, you needed to do a drum part, so you dragged your drums and you recorded <laughs> them um, yeah. in real life. IRL, as the kids say, right? That's right. <laughs> so new record, uh, Ever Blossom. It's out everywhere now. People can listen to it. Um, roller skating. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a video of Anthony trying to roller skate, and I couldn't believe that he was a grown-ass man. <laughs> He's, okay, I guess he inline skated a little bit when he was a kid, but like he can't ride a skateboard worth of shit. Like he just doesn't have balance that way. But he's a drummer. But he's got coordination. He's like he's got coordination, and he's actually pretty athletic. Like he plays basketball multiple times a week. Like he's a fairly athletic dude. Uh, but <laughs> he ate <laughs> fucking shit. The second he put the skates on, it was like, oh, I'm gonna film a TikTok. He literally ate shit and knocked over the drum set in my garage trying to keep himself <laughs> up, and then went outside. And so it's like. He was he was on it for a total of like 50 seconds, less than a minute. He was on these skates and he ate shit three times within that one minute right in front of my house. (laughs) So funny. So can you can you talk about the video? Because that's sort of like why you guys started doing these roller skating videos is because you made a video where you're skating down this. So did you I don't want to make any spoilers alert for people, but. (laughs) <laughs> there's no spoilers the video's out there <laughs> it's out there that's true it's out there uh but i encourage everybody to watch it for one it's it's i i was just mesmerized i don't know why <laughs> what is it about watching a grown-ass man with shorts and a a, a kind of a very fitting button-up shirt that's like your style uh yeah. 
and a beard, like a nice long beard. <laughs> it's just, so, I guess it's not something you see every day. And then you're no, just roller no. skating. Just it's, it's like, is this Macklemore? What is, what's happening here? <laughs> So we came up with the concept for the video. Um, it's for a song called If It's Cool With You, I'm Cool With Being Through, which is kind of like a, l- a little take on Saves the Day. But uh, the song is like this real like mid-tempo, like just pocket jam, right? Mm-hmm. And when we were in the studio recording it, like I was so stoked on the vibe of the song. I was like, I was like, dude, I feel like this is the perfect tempo to just like carve like roller skating, you know, like it's just, (laughs) I don't know why, but it's the tempo where it's like, cool. it feels like a cool breeze is on me and I could just see myself just carving to it. And I was like, I was like, that could be a cool music video. And then I kind of, I went and bought a pair of roller skates and I was like, I'm going to learn how to roller skate so that I could do this for a video, you know? And I started roller skating around my neighborhood and stuff. And and my wife and I, sorry to interrupt. You didn't know how to roller skate before this? I had been when I was a kid, you know, and just eat right. shit at the skate depot over in Buena Park, uh, or not but, Buena Park, Cerritos. And but you weren't like so, a speed so skater that was as it. a kid, or no, anything. no, I, I, I was a skateboarder, so I never really roller skated. Okay, because uh, we had a war, you know. It's what like I mean? getting on you know, a pair skaters of skaters versus. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So Sorry. Back to this. I, I bought learning. I bought the roller skates and I started practicing a bit and I just like kind of go out in the alley behind my house and and skate and stuff. And I started thinking to myself, I go, I don't think I'm going to be good enough to occupy three and a half minutes of a video. Like, I'm not going to have enough moves, you know, like, I'm like, okay, I can do the spin. I can go backwards. I can kind of carve a little bit, but that's pretty much it. You know, like I was watching videos and stuff and I was trying to learn how to, how to do this stuff. And I was like, I'm going to be good, but not great. So I'm going to have to come up with the concept for the music video that to occupy the rest of the time. So there needs to be some kind of plot point. And so I was actually driving on the freeway one day and there's a gardening truck in front of me and they had one of those, um, it basically looked like a scythe coming out the back of the truck, but it was like what they used to cut like big branches on trees. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know why, but I just had this thought in my head. I was like, if I pulled up next to this truck and this big scythe was hanging out the back and it was just a fucking grim reaper driving the truck and looked over at me, I was like, that would be such a striking image. And I was like, Oh, that could be a music video. And then I just slammed those two music videos together in, in my head. And I was like, I was like, okay, reaper in a truck he's chasing me it's like death is chasing me but i'm just having too good of a time to be bothered by it you know so i'm (laughs) just kind of carving and stuff and so it turned into anthony being the grim reaper and he it's like he's chasing me throughout the music video but i'm skating down the road no matter what happens you're cool you're skating (laughs) yeah okay that makes so much sense yeah that's cool damn i can't believe okay i can't believe one you didn't fall and just completely kill yourself I didn't eat shit, and it, we did it in Joshua Tree, and the roads there, they're not super, like, smooth. It's not like skating at the beach on concrete. It's, like, shitty asphalt for the most part. But we found, like, just, like, a gentle slope part where we filmed most of the stuff of me skating, and we did it over, like, a day and a half out there. Uh, we just had two of our buddies come out to do the to do the video, but I came up with the whole concept, and... It did it. It was like it was a hot ass day because we did it in summertime before the the song dropped. Yeah, but we knocked it out, man. It's and it's like sometimes my ideas are a little bigger than we're able to uh, execute. But this one was like that's might be my favorite video we've ever done because that was really what my vision was, and somehow we we were actually able to execute it. Because Anth will sometimes have to talk me down. Like I'll, I'll come up with like a big grand idea, and he's like. That's not going to be possible. We don't have the money to do that. It's not, it's like, we're not going to be able to have this. Like, you can't do stunts in our music video. Like, I've had music videos of me falling off buildings, and I just have these ridiculous ideas that realistically we can't get done. Uh, and in fact, we actually went to the YouTube space once in LA to film something, and we're in one of the warehouse spaces, and I set up this big thing, and I have like these cushions underneath because I'm going to just do like a deadfall, like, you know, with the camera right in front of me and fall backwards. Yeah. And the guy saw us on camera see, seeing me setting up pillows and stuff like that. And he comes in, he's like, he's like, are you guys doing stunts in here? We're like, we're like, no, 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 I'm just going to fall off this thing. He's like, he's like, you can't do that. You can't, you can't just be falling off of like tall ledges in our, in our place. And so we had to scrap a whole music video because. <laughs> I that was these, the whole idea. <laughs> that wasn't the whole idea, but it was much of it. You know, yeah, yeah. there was going to be, a, there was a lot of, there was, I was going to fall off a ladder. I was going to fall off a ledge. I was going <laughs> to, so there's times where my ideas get the best of me, but this yeah. was the one where everything came to fruition. Well, I wanted to ask you, you know, this is a perfect segue into just 
self-releasing the record and kind of being in charge of the budgets and and now it's us deciding what to do and i mean i don't know we could talk there's so many facets you know we could go into um but uh i guess i kind of want to know how what you guys did i mean did you hire other companies for marketing or for like facebook ads or internet ads in general or are you literally doing everything yourself i don't know how much you want to go into that but i would love to no get a we are insight. super open yeah that, that's like we've that's been part of our our thing for a long time is just to be like i think a lot of people show highlight reels and pretend everything's honky dory or try to always look bigger than they really are and stuff we are a small club band doing this on our own we, we came from our last record at Epitaph. We did three records with them. Our last one, we had like a $100,000 budget just to make the record and then money on top of that to market it. You know, like, so we went and did a record with like a Grammy award winning producer and had the craziest experience making a record ever. And then, you know, two years later, we're making the bedroom record, you know, and do yeah. that, doing it on our own uh, <laughs> with minimal money, minimal gear, minimal knowledge, but just a lot of fire to do it. And, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's been like we paid somebody to mix and master the record. Uh, it's a guy named Jason Suido. He, uh, he lives in Costa Mesa and plays in a band called Sir Sly. Uh, he has been part of the, this wildlife kind of camp uh, f since our inception. He did our first two EPs he produced. And then from there, he kind of mixed most of our records except for the very last one. And so he's still still very much a part of that. But the only real like cost of making the record, we spent two grand to get uh, the mosaic made for the album art itself. Uh, and then we paid um, to get all of the songs mixed and mastered by him. But this record was made for with a fraction of the budget of our last records. Right. Mm -hmm. And we knew going into the last one, we were like the first two records. We didn't spend close to what the budget was, because if you don't spend the budget, they'll just give you the rest of the money. And so we're like two ratty dudes from Long Beach were like, yeah, let's take the fucking money and run, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so on the last one though, we go, you know what? Let's spend every fucking dollar there is because we never know if we'll have an, an opportunity to go make a record with somebody like this guy, Ryan Hadlock ever again. And so, you know, he had done like the Lumineers record, Vance Joy, Brandy Carlisle. Um, and he's up, he's up in Washington. And so we, we just went for it. We're just like, fuck it, let's do this thing. And, we walked away from that going, that was the greatest experience ever. It was worth every penny. I don't care if we lost money out doing it this way because the record, I'll be able to listen to it to the day I die and think about that experience and how amazing it was. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, two years later, going in and doing the bedroom record, it was just, how can we make this sound as good as possible with what we've got here with a freaking little UA interface and a couple of microphones and that experience was, was awesome, man, because like Anthony had never recorded anything in his life. And I've been recording demos on pro tools and logic since, uh, you know, 2006 or something. And I had to kind of like walk him through it. He just bought like a total mirrored setup from mine. And then he'd start learning how to record guitar and send me stuff and be like, how does this sound? I'd be like, Oh, well, it's a little bit noisy or it sounds like the mic is too fucking close to you or I hear you breathing or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and so it was like, he was learning and he's gotten so good at recording guitar over the last kind of year and a half. It's like, it's really impressive to me and it's inspiring when you see somebody, uh, pick up something new. Uh, and it's something maybe you've taken for granted that you're doing for a long time. Like for me recording, I never really thought much of it because it was always just get the demo done. You know, that's all I needed to worry about. And now it's turned into, OK, I'm making records now. I need to I need to like really dive into this and and get into the art form of making records, not just is this working? OK, make the demo, you know. So yeah. it's like I had the tools in my arsenal to, to record already. Yeah but I wasn't really doing it at a level of, of like making a, a finished product. So making this record was, it took a long time, but it, but it, uh, I think going into making the next record, we go, yeah, we're going to make the next record ourselves again, you know, cause yeah. it's the process was longer because we're learning how to get, how to do it as we go. But the reward was we, we put out the record, we go, I think this stands up to our last recordings, you know, like getting it with the, the, the joke is fix it when we mix it, obviously. And, you know, we probably had to fix a little more in this current mix than the last albums, but it was fixed. And we ended up with, uh, with a record that we're really proud of. That's dope. I mean, you invested in yourself, right? Like 
I mean, I guess it's all an investment in yourself, even if you're spending all the money to go experience or investing in that experience yeah. of recording a big in a big studio with a big producer. And then you're investing in yourself in a different way by learning to make a record yourself and going, OK, I've just taught myself how to fish um, or at least catch the fish. Now I can have yeah. this guy clean the fish. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, but, you know, mixing is, is not easy. I, I used to mix a little bit. And I never felt like I was great at it. I have a few records I mixed. And I was like, okay, I could, I did that. But they were all more acoustic, uh, Americana style, yeah. um, bluegrass stuff. Like I really was into that. But anytime I would like mix my own MXPX stuff, I was just like, I, I got to have somebody that knows more than me do this because it's not sounding the way I want it to sound. And it's my fault. So <laughs> yeah, I, I just kind of looked at, looked at it this way. I go, we're going to invest money into doing this. Uh, and, I did like one text test mix of our first single off the record, a song called nothing hurts like love for the first time. And we sent it to our whole team and everyone was like, this sounds really great. And, and Anth was like convinced. He's like, dude, I think you can mix this record. And I was just like, I was like, I want to hear a test mix and put it up against that. Because sometimes when you listen to something, you go, yeah, this is great. And then you AB it with somebody who does this day in and day out for a living and is a real, an actual professional. And you go, Oh, there's there's room for improvement here for sure, you know. And so when we got that test mix back, it was just like, well, yeah, this is 15 to 20 percent better, and it took him a day, you know, and it took me a week. So moving forward, doing the next nine songs on the album, do I want to spend weeks doing it and know that the end result is going to be 20 percent worse than what somebody else could accomplish? And and we have somebody who's so close to us uh, that's like a friend of ours that does this for a living and is, is a professional let's go you know what this guy we make a record every two years this guy is mixing records every week so he's he's in tune with it like he is he's prepped he's ready to go he's already in the flow of doing this let's let's invest the money there to make the final product better like i'm never going to be too proud you know anthony and i are both the same way like we have no pride of I need to play this part on this song. Like in the studio, it's like, bro, take this guitar away from me because I can't play this shit, dude. Like you need to play this for me. And so he's the same way. Like he plays drums live, but, um, I just have a little more touch than Anthony does. He's a punk drummer and we're not a punk band. Right. And so I grew up playing like along to a lot of like R and B and funk and hip hop and jazz. And so I just have a little more touch than him. So I play the drums on the records because he's not going to be too proud to, to do that. And so, when we look at things like that, I go, I could play bass on this song, but man, it would be cool to bring in somebody else who's really, really talented bass player. Or I could tinker around at the piano and make something work, but what if we brought somebody in who, they're a pianist, this is what they do for a living. And so we've started to do that uh, on the the third record, Petaluma. We brought in like string players, um, stand-up bass players, pianists, a lot of horn players and stuff. And it was just so much fun to bring in these badass players, man, and have them play on our record that just really elevated the, the the record itself that we wanted to carry that over into this. Now, again, we're not in a studio, right? So now we're instead of bringing somebody into the pro studio to track with us, we're just emailing people back and forth. Uh, I don't know if you've if do you know Sky Accord? He plays bass. Uh, he, he played in the band Issues. Now he's playing with Twenty One Pilots. No, I don't know. Mm-mm. So we brought him on because something that somebody that we met on a warp tour years ago. He's my favorite bass player I've ever seen live. And I was just like, how cool would it be to have Sky play bass on this song? Like this song could really use like a, almost like a country inspired bass line. And I don't know how to fucking play that. You know, I could program it or Anth could fiddle away on his bass and try and make it work. But Sky would probably just knock this out of the park. Let's just try and get Sky on the track. And so we did that with a few different songs on this record. Uh, bringing somebody in that's just a badass player to play over our song and elevate it that much more. That's dope. No, I mean, collab, I think bringing people in brings that texture, you know, and it's like, for sure. Like, I write the song for MXPX, but it doesn't really become an MXPX song until those other guys are playing on it because it, whatever they do makes it sound like we sound. And I'm sure it's the same for you guys. And then you add another bass player for that certain sound and it, it adds that texture. Um, you guys are doing it. I mean, you're doing making some good decisions as far as, you know, as far as I know. Uh, I'd love to talk about your vocal style, like very high falsetto, a lot of falsetto stuff. Like, how did you where did that come from? 
Do you always I'm sing not, like that? I'm not exactly sure, but but what I will tell you is that it's not how I wanted to sing. Uh, <laughs> when I, <laughs> my favorite band in the world is Thrice, uh, Dustin Kensrue. You know, I mean, if I guess if you were just to describe my voice and then describe Dustin Kensrue's voice, you would be describing basically polar opposites, right? So he has a really gruff powerful manly voice and then me on the other hand i kind of have a pretty smooth uh y- you know just light airy voice right and i grew up belting in my shower belting in my car along to thrice and i did everything possible to try to sing like dustin kensru and it never fucking clicked it never worked because that's just not what my voice sounds like and i tried really hard to get that <sighs> the freaking grit when I hit the t- the high top notes where it turns into a yell and a scream and I could belt it out and it just never happened. And at some point along the way, I just had to tell myself, you are fighting against your own, like basically biology here. Cause you're just not built that way, bro. <laughs> like you got to just do what you're good at. And what I had always been kind of good at was singing along to prettier stuff, you know, like I, in high school, listening to Sarah Bareilles, I was like, well, I can sing every note on Little Voice by Sarah Bareilles, but I can't sing my favorite Thrice records. So what am what am I doing exactly? You know, and I kind of started to develop more of the the falsetto and the airiness and and singing singing softer instead of trying to belt. And I think I just kind of fell into a place of this is where I have my strong suits. I know what I'm not good at now. When I I didn't before, I wanted to be good at what I was bad at. Now I've accepted the things that I am good at and I u- use that to my advantage in my songwriting. Yeah, I, I got to say it's it's very unique and it's like I try to I, – maybe I have like one or two parts, even parts where I sing falsetto and it's so hard for me, right? Like it's not easy for me to sing falsetto consistently. And so to hear your style, it's like, whoa, that is – that's that must be just like – what comes out naturally because it is hard for me to do that. So like everybody yeah, I, has I love singing in falsetto. <laughs> it's e- it's easy for me. That's like, cool. It's w- when I belt and sing the high <laughs> stuff live, that's where I'm like, boy, I'm running out of the gas up here, you know, but the falsetto stuff, I could just sing it all day. Right. Right. I feel like, I mean, I, I guess I haven't really tried to sing it all day, but if I did, I feel like it, my voice would crack or, or it would get, it would just start going away. I don't have. To, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain point when you're singing falsetto that if you sing falsetto too low, it'll break, and then you have to move to your head voice and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm not like a super tech, technically savvy singer, right? But there's that breaking point between your your falsetto and your head voice and your full voice, and some people are able to like bridge all of those seamlessly and move in and out of them in just a beautiful effortless way. And I, unfortunately am not one of them. I have to pick, I I go, I'm either singing up here or I'm singing in my head voice or I'm singing my full voice and I can move from one to the other and then stay there. But I can't just kind of effortlessly glide through those different voices that I have. Uh, and it's probably, it's probably something that I could work at, But again, it's just it's one of those things where I go, well, I'm not naturally doing that. I'm also naturally not able to do a bunch of runs and stuff like I don't have that kind of voice. When I hear people doing crazy vocal like R&B stuff, I go, well, I've never been able to sing like that. And I don't I don't really care to practice doing it that way. Like I'm the same way with guitar. I don't want to sit down and practice guitar in a way that makes me feel like it's just like I'm just here putting in my 30 minutes of scales like I want to love this thing, man. And I don't love it when I do it that way. I love it when I strike a chord and it makes me think of a melody. I love singing when it makes me feel a certain way, but I mm. don't love singing scales or playing scales on guitar. It just kills it for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think you, you're doing what, what feels good, you know, yeah. and I think that's something that a lot of, well, it takes time. It takes like, it took you time. You didn't know to do that right away. And I feel like I had the same experience where I just, over time, I would start writing and I'd start singing parts that I was better at. And maybe I just, you know, we, we get better as we go. So maybe that's why. But but yeah, I, I think I love that the way you described, like you play, you play a chord and you think of a melody or something to sing and you, you sing something and it feels right. You know, like, I mean, that's it's really hard to describe how to write songs, but you kind of are that's the beginning of it. If it feels right, you keep going in that direction and you keep, and you get deeper and then you start writing down words maybe, but, 
but yeah, I mean, it's such a, <laughs> it's such an unscientific thing I, from my standpoint. Oh, super unscientific. Like I, I, the only way that I can describe it like visually of songwriting is like, it's like, I'm not writing the song. It's like the song is like, <laughs> I'm in a room full of bubbles and every bubble is, is a melody, right. Or a guitar part. And I'm just like, okay, I pop that one. Okay. Here's the melody. And it kind of just like comes, it's not like I'm going C sharp, a uh, F uh, mm -hmm. no. And then, you know, it's like, I don't know any of that shit. And it just like, it just comes to you and it's, you hear it before you sing it. You hear like hearing something in your head before you actually make the sounds to me is like, it's, it's uh, at, at risk of sounding corny. It's almost like a spiritual thing where it's just like, these things just like come to you and it's not like work. Like most of the songwriting to me is pretty effortless because like I said, it's almost like these melodies are writing themselves. Cause I strike a chord. I go, Oh, that sounds kind of cool. Oh, I can hear this in my head. And then it's, and then you go with it. And I've always been the type that my first idea is, is either going to be the best idea or I'm moving on. Like I kind of just don't beat myself up over stuff. Um, I don't write songs often. Like when we make a record, I might write 20 ideas or 30 ideas, but I'm not writing songs all year long. Cause it's, okay. it's like, I, like I said before, it's like, I just kind of want to stay loving it. And I feel like if I turn it into something where I got to turn on my laptop today and come up with an idea, I need to do it. Uh, I don't want to stop loving it the way that I do. It's like, to me, I don't look at it like something like you got to work out five days a week or else you're going to, you know, you're going to fall apart. N to me, I don't want to treat it that way. I want to separate it and go, I want to get into it. And when I'm in songwriting mode, the next three months, I'm going to freaking sit down and love doing this. And then I'm going to turn it off for a while and come and revisit it when I feel like I have something else left to write about or something else to say, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I kind of like, I like it because it's like problem solving in a way. Like, you know, for me, I'll come up with an idea and then there'll be something about it that isn't, that I'm like, I like this, but I don't like the next thing or the yeah. thing that I, you know, or, and so like, to me, it's like, oh, this is like me solving a problem. And, and it's, I don't know, like, and, and another aspect of that is getting bored as a songwriter. I don't know if you allow yourself to get bored and to not do much. Um, it comes, it's, it's hard in this life, you know, cause like, appointment here, this here, whatever. But, uh, I've found just getting bored is the best, like, like sit there, think about songs. But if you, if you don't think of anything, just don't do anything. And I, I mean, I haven't had any issues with so song or writing block writer's block or anything like that. But like, if I did, I feel like it's because I'm not bored enough. Things are too busy. Like if I don't have an, a good idea, I feel like it's because I'm doing too much in life. And so there, therefore, put the songwriting away, live your life, do your things, and then you can write about it later. Um, it's a subconscious thing. You, like, refill the well, so to yeah. speak. You, like, go live your life w and do whatever you do, and the songs will come. Yeah, it's, I, when I'm done making a record, I'm like, the last thing I want to fucking do is pick up my guitar and write another song right now. Like, I want to live through this this album for a while and perform these songs and, and think about other things so that when I come back to pick up my guitar and sit in my bedroom again, that I'm refreshed, refilled, like you said, and I'm excited to do it again. But I also str I struggle a lot, man, with like every time I write a song and I, and I don't you might feel this way, too. I think a lot of people do. You write a song. Whatever is your newest song is your best song. <laughs> yes, right? of course. It but should only be. In the but only in the time being. <laughs> Whether it's your best yeah. song or not, you think it's your best song, whatever the newest song is. And so, like, I get hyped on myself in those moments. I go, boy, you still fucking got it. Like, you just wrote, you just wrote your best song yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And immediately, that, that switch flips, man. And I go, that's the last good song you have in you. You're running out. And your next that like, how are you going to write your next song, bro? Because it's over. Like, I just I have that fuck. It just mm. creeps over me and it just boom. All of a sudden I go, fuck that song, man. That's that's the last one. That's the last one. And, and the next one that I write is just going to be dog shit. And it's going to have no heart. It's going to have nothing behind it. No guts, you know. And I just and it, no matter how many songs I write, 
that feeling doesn't go away. I mm. still feel like there's just something scratching at the door saying it's <clears throat> fucking over. And the next thing you do, nobody's going to give a shit about it. You're not going to give a shit about it because you're going to know that it was came from an insincere place or it was just a poor man's melody or something. And I just it's like I never have confidence that I'm a good songwriter, mm. even though when I make songs, I love them. I love the fucking music we make so much. Uh, but that feeling just never goes away, man. Do you, I, do you have confidence like that writing? I, I have, I know what you mean. I've felt that before. And, and I think for the most part, I've learned to ignore that. I've learned anytime that thought has crept in lately in this, this year, I, I always tell myself one, you've already written, you know, recently a bunch of songs that are good. So, you know, that's, that's that. And then every time I think, okay, that's, I'm never going to write a better song than that. Like you just said, I just turn it around. I just tell myself, actually, it doesn't even matter because every people like some of my worst songs, (laughs) (laughs) you know what I mean? So, so like, I I just kind of like, honestly, like when I write a song, I feel the same way you feel. I feel like it's my best song. And then I'll bring it to the guys or something and it'll be like, "Okay, this isn't my best song, but it's still pretty good, you know." <laughs> but, <laughs> you start you start turning on it. <laughs> you start turning on it. You're like, "Okay, I was a little I was a little overzealous." But but there's got to be something about each song that makes it give you that feeling. And and to me, you know, to me as a songwriter, I can write a song and be done with it in one day, sure. But I almost never do that. I almost always will will tweak apart a lyric, one thing here and there. I wanted to say that a, a better way, like that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, so I give myself an out mentally that even if I write a shitty song, I'm just going to fix it. I'm going to fix this bit. You'll just revisit it. Yeah, yeah. So and, and another good thing about just being okay with writing bad songs is is – it clears the palate for the next good song. So like, no matter what, I feel like it's a a good thing to just keep writing through it. And and there's plenty of songs that I don't finish, that being said. So I'm not saying write a bad song that is, you know, is bad and is like, you know, that. What I'm saying is, if there's something about it that gave you the, the idea, go with that. Like, you don't have to use all the parts that you write. Which, you know, we could kind of end on this with songwriting, but putting two different ideas, I know you guys have done that. I've done that so many times. Uh, I just saw a video and I thought it was really cool how you did the video, how Anthony sent you an idea, you sent him an idea, and and then you guys used basically two different songs, took out the parts you didn't like, and made one song out of it. Frankenstein. The the old Frankenstein, yeah. Yeah. Now that's very. I mean, that probably happens more more often than not, to be honest. With at least one song on a record, right? But, I mean, if you have a really good idea, it just didn't work out. Maybe it's because the rest of the parts of the song aren't good. Yeah. So take the best part, put it with something new, make sure it fits, and. and yeah, sometimes a a good chorus that's not a great chorus could make a great bridge. Mm-hmm. You know, like so, sometimes sometimes that kind of stuff works, but. Uh, I have found that more often than not, if you have to like bastardize the original version of that part so much in the key that it's in, in the tempo that it's in, the chords that are around it, that it loses the spirit of what it was initially. If you have to change it too much, it usually doesn't feel right to me. And I don't know if that's because of my perspective, because I've already heard it the one way, like and and that's the the hardest thing about songwriting is that you do not have any perspective, right? Because I am inside this song, and I see all of the different like colors and shades and textures. But when I show it to somebody else, it's just black and white. Boom! It's 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 just one sound, right? Mm-hmm. But to me, it's all of the parts. It's the lyrics. It's how it makes me feel. It's all of these things, and I will never know what it's like to be the the just a basic casual listener, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's tough for me to do the Frankensteining like that. The video that you're talking about is a song that ended up on this record and it was, it took so much work. I'm telling you you, like hours on me and Ant sitting on zoom going back and forth and I'd play it and I go, I don't think so. He's like, no, you're onto it. Keep going, keep going. All right. 
dude, I just think they should be two different songs. And like, it took so much convincing for me to get it to the place. <laughs> uh, but now that I've heard it that many times, I kind of forget about the initial demos. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe there was enough of a palate cleanser, like you were saying earlier, that like, now this is the song and this is the way it was always supposed to be. I just took a while to get there. But that for, for me is actually like, that's the exception, not the rule. I am very quick to dismiss ideas. Like I just, I don't like beating myself up over them. I don't like rewriting choruses. Um, if yeah, I, I just look at it and I go, if we don't think this is good enough, the next idea could be better instead of ripping myself apart over this idea. And like, like you said, there, there might be something there that made you want to go down that path. Mm -hmm. But like what we don't allow ourselves to do now when we're songwriting is go too far down that path. Right. Cause if you do a verse, a chorus, a second verse, a a second chorus, a bridge, you elevate, you do all these things. Well now if I send that to Anth and I do a whole demo of a fucking three and a half minute song and I fell in love with it and he's lukewarm on it. Well, now I have this battle to fight, right? Of is this going to be, am I going to be able to convince him that this is a good song? And so now instead, I don't allow myself to go down that road. I will write a verse and a chorus. That's the demo. It's one verse, one chorus. And if we want to make a bunch of these demos of verses and choruses, then when we have what we think are the strongest like potential songs, now let's go down that road and develop the song fully, do leads, get into the bridge, elevate the second verse, more harmony, more this and that, and really go down the road there. But I just, I get, I get too heartbroken too easily <laughs> with songs that like, if, if I write something and I really like it, but Anth doesn't really care for it, then it's, it's not going to be this wildlife song. And the same goes for him. But the, the, the issue is that, I am a very emotional person. Anth is the complete opposite. He just like, he will throw riffs at me all day long. And he writes guitar riffs every fucking day of his life. He's super prolific with that. And so when I show an idea to him, it's like, this is my heart and soul. When he shows an idea to me, it's, (laughs) this is the riff I wrote today, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And so he did, he had, there was one month when we were writing our last record where he goes, I'm going to send you a riff every single day in Gmail Listen to it. If you if something comes to mind, just track the idea and send it back to me. Uh, and it's like he's like, I'm not going to be hurt by it. And so I've had to like kind of condition myself because like I can't even write with other people in the room, man. I just have to have my space, and I don't like um, I don't like fucking up in front of people. And I feel like that's what singing and songwriting is to me is just fucking up until you get it right, you know? Yeah. And I don't like fucking up in front of people because I'm too self-conscious, so I just have to have my space. Like, my wife needs to be at work for me to pull up, pick up the guitar and start singing and stuff. Like, only the dogs can be here hearing what's going on in this room because <laughs> because that's that's where I feel comfortable. I feel safe enough to explore ideas and suck, man. Just uh, find the place where the song is supposed to be. Like, I want to put my capo on my guitar and sing it as high as I possibly can and suck and then go, okay, well, I I definitely need to move the capo down so I can hit these fucking notes. But I want the space to do that. And doing that with other people in the room is impossible for me. Do you write with other people in the room? I don't know. Find your suck. That's what I got out of that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, My dog is fine, but uh, anybody else, (laughs) the kids will tell me to shut up and same with my wife pretty much. I mean, like, I have to go to the studio, you know, get my yeah. own space. And, uh, but it's more for me, honestly, like I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I'm putting out very dumb ideas a lot of times Sure, yeah. <laughs> that I don't want, you know, I, I'm just too self-conscious, I guess, too self-conscious. If somebody's there, like listening, same thing, like even and it's funny because I even get self-conscious backstage when I'm warming up just on an acoustic guitar. I'm just like, do, 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 do. Like if somebody, a bunch of people are around, if my band guys are there, it doesn't matter. But anybody else, I feel like they're going to think I'm a weirdo. Cause I'm like singing back, but I'm literally a singer and I'm about to do a show in th- front of thousands of people. But my brain says, don't bother people. It's like, wait, this is my <laughs> backstage. What? <laughs> These people are drinking my beverages right now. <laughs> when I come back from the, from the dress to the dressing room after the show, all the beer will be gone. <laughs> That's my fucking veggie tray they're eating from right now. <laughs> exactly. Well, dude, this has been, I, I love this conversation. It's been great. Uh, songwriting, the new album, Ever Blossom, the videos yes, that sir. you guys have been putting out, you know. Uh, great to great to get to chat with you and get to know you a little bit. Thanks for doing it. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. Been a been a casual fan for a long time now, and and I've seen a lot of my like uh, a lot of my peers and a lot of my friends come on the podcast with you and stuff, and so it's cool to come here and, and chop it up with you. And uh, I hope I, I can catch your band one of these days uh, locally here in Phoenix. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely be back. Um, one one thing before we go, it's it's going to be Thanksgiving. So is there any sort of Thanksgiving thing that you love? It could be just traditional, but what are some of your favorite things that you like to eat? Food. Um, I'm I'm just a huge food guy. I just love. I'm a I'm a glutton at heart. Like I have to really work to not just be a gigantic human being. Uh, so we just moved into a new house, my wife and I, uh, after she graduated from nursing school and just started, started working about six months ago. So we kind of got out of a crappy area and now we're in a nicer area and I would love to just have my family over and cook a meal for everybody. Cause I've never been able to host a holiday at, at my own place before. Cause we never had the space. So that, that's what I'm, I'm really looking forward to is, is hosting our, our first Thanksgiving here at our new home. Perfect. Leveling up. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll Alrighty, talk Mike. again soon. All right, dude. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody.